Hi, church family. It's good to be with you all again today as we have story and word from Pastor. And I'm excited to join alongside Pastor Glenn and provide for us as a church family a, a, a midweek encouragement, uh, just encouraging us in the faith as we look at stories that have taken place uh, within, uh, within Christian history, really. Uh, today, this video will be going out Friday. However, in the weeks to come, we hope to have the video on Wednesday and kind of provide a little midweek encouragement. So be looking forward for that next week, Wednesday, um, when the next video will hopefully go out. This Today, I want to share with us a very popular story. I believe it's one that many of us know. I don't believe this will be a new story for most of us, maybe some of us, but I don't believe for most of us. And this is the story of the five men, uh, Jim Elliott, Peter Fleming, Ed McCulley, Nate Saint, and Roger uh, Yadarian, and their um, desire to see an unreached people group saved with the gospel um, amidst the fact that it cost them their, their very lives. A couple weeks back, and there, there's been, I'll say this, there's been many, many different accounts of this story written. There's been a few books written, a movie written about this, uh, many different articles written about this. This isn't a very new story. But I believe that it's one that we can take great encouragement um, for us today. And so I'll be reading this story out of Jesus Freaks DC Talk. And uh, it's a very simplified version, though there is a movie called End of the Spear. We have it here at the church. My wife and I watched it a couple weeks ago, which might have inspired me uh, sharing this story with us today. And I'll speak more toward that at the end uh, when we look at application. So the story. The missionaries looked from one face to another and the group around them, but each they read the same quiet resolve. Everyone knew the danger was very real, and it seemed unlikely that all of them would come out unharmed. But no matter how deadly this tribe was considered, here was a group that had never heard the gospel before. In the face of this, the risks were irrelevant. They had to do something to contact this people and tell them about Jesus. They aren't even called by the right name among the tribes that we have already reached, Jim Elliot echoed again. The, Ki the Kishua people called them the Aka, which simply means savages in the Kishua tongue. Everyone seems to echo that they are deathly afraid of outsiders and will shoot first and ask questions later. They will kill anyone for simply setting foot in their part of the forest. Now all of those present nodded soberly, but it was Nate Saint who spoke what they were all really thinking. Yes, we know all of that. That is not the issue we are here to discuss. We know the risk. What we need to know is how do we get them the gospel? In the coming weeks, they worked out a plan and began to implement it with the utmost patience and caution. In their planning, they met with an area farmer who directed them to Dayume, a woman who worked for him. She had once lived among the Aka, but escaped. From her, they learned some helpful words and phrases in the language of these people. They also learned that they called themselves the Harani people, literally people in their own language. But, she also warned, do not trust them. To you, they might seem friendly for a while, but they will not stop short of killing. In September 1955, Nate Saint and Ed McCulley, two of the missionaries, had seen a cluster of Harani houses while flying in Nate's airplane. This had inspired them to use the plane to scout for Harani villages from the air and figure out some way to use it to make their presence welcome in the area before they made face-to-face -face contact with them. The others agreed, but Jim reminded them, if outside groups or the newspapers find out we're trying to reach the Harani, curious people might hurry in. That would scare off the Harani or get people killed. We must move slowly and keep our plan a secret. More flights over the area showed several more Harani clearings. The first time Nate flew his plane low over the main clearing, which the missionaries nicknamed Terminal City, the Harani scattered in fright. But then the missionaries began dropping gifts tied to a rope, t-shirts, machetes, cloth, even pictures of the five men. Later they were excited to see a few Harani waving at the plane and others wearing the gifts. Nate flew as low as he dared, and the missionaries leaned out of the plane, calling out in the Harani language, I like you. I am your friend. Then something exciting happened. 
As Nate slowly circled the Harani clearing after dropping the rope, the Harani tied on some gifts of their own. Headbands of colorful feathers, and even a parrot. Three months went by as the missionaries tried to get the Harani people used to the small yellow airplane flying over their villages. Finally, in December, as Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Ed McCulley, Pete Fleming, and Roger Yadarian got together to plan the next steps in the Operation uh, Harani, they made an important decision. It was time to actually make face-to-face -face meeting. The place for this meeting were made with even more care than the rest. First, the five missionaries would land on a strip of beach on the river nearest Terminal City. Then they would build a treehouse for safety from jungle animals. They would wait for several days letting the Harani get used to their presence before attempting to make contact. On Tuesday, January 3rd, 1956, it took pilot Nate Saint five trips to fly in all five men and their supplies. The landings and takeoffs on the beach were very tricky, but the worst problem was the flying insects. The men got in touch with their wives each day, either by shortwave radio or with notes sent with Nate in his plane. After a few days of camping on the beach, the men began calling out Harani phrases of welcome across the river. It was eerie as they knew they, most, they must be under close surveillance, but they never saw a soul besides one another. On Friday, however, they were finally rewarded. A Harani, a Harani man and two women appeared on the opposite bank of the river. Jim Elliott waded out toward them, using all the Harani phrases he knew, to help lead them safely across. It was an exciting day. The missionaries took pictures of the visit and even took the man, who they nicknamed George, up into the plane for a ride over his village. Saturday, Nate and Pete flew back to base, base camp to pick up supplies and report their progress. They returned to the beach on Sunday morning, January 8th. When they landed, Nate radioed back to his wife, pray for us. We're sure we'll have contact again today. We'll radio again at 4.30. Elizabeth Elliot and the other wives gathered eagerly around the radio later that afternoon. But 4.30 came and went. Nothing. When they still had not heard from the men by Monday morning, they knew something was wrong. A search party made its way to the river camp. Five bodies were found in the river. The men had been killed by the Harani lances. Now this tragic story soon appeared in newspapers around the world. Some people thought the five men were foolish to try to make friends with such a savage Indian tribe. A waste of lives, they said. But others responded differently. In universities and churches around the globe, over a thousand young people volunteered to become missionaries in the place of these five brave men. In Ecuador, attendance by natives at mission schools and church services reached record levels and the number of conversions skyrocketed. A member of another tribe, the Javero tribe, followed the example of these men and went with the gospel to another Javero tribe that had been at war with his for years. His visit brought peace between the two groups. Eventually, Rachel Saint, Nate Saint's sister, and Elizabeth Elliot lived among the very Haroni who had murdered their family members. These women learned the Harani language and translated the Bible for them. Now the question still remains, how did these men die? What went wrong? When the relationship between the Harani and the missionaries was more solidified sometime later, these questions were posed to one of the men who had been involved in killing of the five men. He explained that up until that point, all of their contact with the outsiders had involved killing or trying to kill one side or the other. And for this reason, their fear of outsiders often prompted them to attack before the others attacked them. In the case of these five white men, the villagers had greatly wondered why they wanted to make contact with them. What profit did they hope to extract from their tribe? They instinctively feared a trap. After the panic that, had, that ended in the murder of the five men, the tribe realized their mistake. In the attack, one of the missionaries had fired two warning shots from a revolver that had accidentally grazed one of the Harani men. Because of this, they realized that the men had had weapons but refused to use them to harm any of the villagers intentionally, even at the expense of their own lives. The Harani could not understand why anyone who could have killed them to save their own lives did not do so. When others finally came in in a similar way, they listened first before they attacked. When they heard the story of Jesus, 
how he had given his life to reconcile man to God, they immediately understood the actions of the first missionaries. It is very possible the Harani and other subsequent, sub, subsequent tribes in their area would never have been reached if these five fools, so to speak, had not acted just like Jesus. The Harani believed the gospel preached because they had seen the gospel lived. Wow. Now again, this story meant is very simplified. Um, it's been, I believe there's two books written on it. Um, there's a movie written on this story and many other articles, I'm sure. But I believe that many of us can be, all of us can be encouraged, even if this is the nth time we've heard this story. Uh, like I said a couple weeks um, earlier, uh, my wife and I watched this movie, the movie End of the Spear, written by Steve Saint, Nate Saint's son, a couple weeks ago. And what caught me, there's many things in the movie that, that kind of moved me, and it was a very emotional movie to watch with my wife. Um, but there's one scene at the, close to the end of the movie that I want to kind of share with us as we kind of apply this to, uh, to us today and close this kind of little brief time. At the near the end of the movie, after Rachel Saint, who is uh, Nate Saint's sister, had lived among the her, uh, among the Harani people uh, for the rest of her life, and so when she had passed away, Steve Saint kind of came for the for the funeral and such. And during this time, at least how the movie portrays it, um, the leader of the of the tribe was still alive. Kind of brought Steve him and him and Steve went alone to the place where the killings took place. And this man just so happened to have killed Steve's father. And so this man kind of picks up a spear and says, like, it, it's right in our culture, in our culture, in our tribe, it's right for the son to take, uh, to take vengeance on the one who killed his father, thus uh, avenging his father. And so in the movie we see this, this the leader of the tribe kind of us bracing to be killed as uh, Steve Saint kind of has a spear ready to, ready to spear him. And in this in this moment, this man just cries out like, like he, "I killed your father! I killed your father!" And Steve looks up like, you, "You did not kill my father. My father willingly uh, gave his life for you." And as I was reflecting on that in the movie, and now just reading this story again, just a beautiful picture of of, of Jesus and, and the cross. Jesus willingly going to the cross as a sheep is led to the slaughter. So so Jesus went went to the cross willingly he gave up his life for us and it is this time around christmas that we celebrate the birth of jesus knowing that he humbled himself he, god gave up his son john 3 16 for god so loved the world that he gave us his son knowing that jesus would become a man and give his life so that all who would believe in him would have eternal life and though there are many applications that we can take away from this story this is just one one that i that god kind of implemented on me today and so, church family, I would encourage you this Christmas season, as as, as we give and and whatnot, let's ask us how how is God asking us to give that we may give the gift of eternal life to someone. All right, blessings on you, church family, and be encouraged. All right, bye.